uh, welcoming you uh, all, ladies and gentlemen, to this um, very uh, important and topical webinar on conversations on central banking. Let me uh, wish everybody good afternoon in Asia, good morning in Europe, and a uh, good very early morning in the Caribbean and Latin America, since I've seen that there have been some registration from that part of the world as well, which attends to the interest of, of this session. This is a fourth uh, installment of a webinar series called uh, Conversations on Central Banking, organized by the Master of Central Banking team at the Asia School of Business here in Kuala Lumpur. My name is Hans Genberg. I'm a professor of economics at the Asia School of Business, and I will be moderating the session today. The topic of today's webinar is building resilience and policy frameworks. And the context is the increasingly complex and unpredictable environment facing central bankers and financial regulators. Technological, institutional, and geopolitical changes are creating new challenges for policymakers. One example is the emerging emergence of digital forms of payment that compete with traditional cap, cash payments and uh, that in some uh, jurisdictions replace cash altogether. And the question is how uh, this will impact the ability of central banks to carry out their mandates of managing well, payment man systems under their jurisdiction and to conduct monetary policy. Another example is the emergence of new types of financial intermediaries that so far operate outside the regulatory parameter. I'm thinking uh, of uh, institutions like Alipay in China, Amazon in the United States and Grab here in Southeast Asia that collectively go by the name of Big Tech. And how uh, the question there is how the emergence of financial intermediaries of this type impact the ability of central banks to safeguard financial stability. So what must central bankers and regulators do to stay focused and resilient in this context? And how do policymakers, uh, policy frameworks need to uh, be structured to face all these challenges? To help us understand and think about the answers to these questions, we are fortunate to have two distinguished and exceptionally experienced central bankers with us today, Dr. Zeti Aziz and Sir Paul Tucker. Most of you already know Dr. Zeti Aziz, who served as governor of Bank Negara Malaysia for 16 years from May 2000 until April 2016. Before that, she had an important role in successfully managing the 1997-1998 Asian financial crisis and the subsequent strong economic recovery of the Malaysian economy. She also oversaw the transformation of the Malaysian financial system in the decade that followed, thereby building its resilience. Dr. Zeti Aziz holds a doctor in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and is currently the co-chair of the Board of Governors of Asia School of Business in collaboration with MIT Sloan and the PNB Group Chairman since 2018. In 2014, Dr. Zeti Aziz was asked to give the prestigious Per Jacobson lecture, which she entitled Managing Financial Crisis in an Interconnected World, Anticipating the Mega Tidal Waves. And I think this is probably a very uh, good background for the discussion we will have today. Sir Paul Tucker, our other panelist, is a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and chair of the Systemic Risk Council. For over 30 years, he was a central banker, including at the Bank of England, the steering committee of the G20 Financial Stability Board, leading his work on resolving too big to fail firms without taxpayer bailouts, and the board uh, on the board of the Bank for International Settlements, chairing the then uh, Committee for Payments and Settlement System. Paul is the author of uh, a book called uh, Unelected Power, which I am a proud owner of. Uh, it was published by uh, Princeton University Press uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, in my view, this is a must read for anybody concerned with increasing demands placed on central banks to deal with the multiple challenges, fa challenges facing the global economy today. 
and he is currently working on another book on international order and systems. So uh, we have agreed that each of, each of the panelists will give 10 to 15 minute introductory remarks, after which we'll move to a Q&A format for the remain, remainder of the webinar, which take a total of one hour. So may I first ask Dr. Zetti to present her thoughts on the issues before us today. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be on this uh, virtual platform together with Paul, uh, whom I've known for so many years in uh, part of the central banking community that we were part of. And uh, to speak on this subject matter of building resilience and policy frameworks. Well, surviving any crisis that confronts any economy will depend on two things, uh, on the extent to which a country, the country concerned has built resilience and the policy framework that it is able to respond to the crisis. Building resilience and policy frameworks has to be done well before the crisis happens. And, um, and it has to be uh, well before such eventualities. For most of Asia, the Asian financial crisis gave us a lot of lessons and uh, building or for building resilience and for building policy frameworks and which we did in the decade that followed. And this has allowed us to, when we face the effects of the 2008-2009 crisis, when it happened, there were tremendous payoffs for us. Yes, of course, we were affected uh, by the, we are highly open economies and we were affected by uh, these developments, but not only did we, saw payoffs from building resilience, but we had in place a more comprehensive policy toolkit. And so we were able to respond and recover within a year from the effects of that crisis. But as Hans mentioned at the beginning of uh, his introduction, uh, the environment that we live in is highly dynamic uh, with many changes, uh, mega trends that are affecting and transforming our environment. Therefore, building resilience and policy frameworks is always an unfinished business for a central bank. We have to continuously be involved in this uh, building of resilience. And it's important to recognize that we will continue to be affected by developments that we can't predict, including this COVID-19 uh, that has taken the world uh, by surprise. We were not in a state of readiness. Uh, for, nobody uh, predicted uh, that this would happen. But uh, by being resilient and having a comprehensive policy framework, we can at least minimize uh, the, its impact and bring about uh, a rapid recovery. Now, this is what resilience is all about. It is ab the ability to withstand these kind of developments and rise up to the challenge of managing it and coming out of it. So the question uh, before us is, what do we have to do to build resilience and the policy framework to be able to rise up to the challenge of the health pandemic and its consequences? Well, I'm going to uh, divide up very quickly uh, that it falls into five major areas. And the first is uh, on the economy. And this is all about building economic flexibility rather than having economic rigidities. And this economic flexibility will allow us to adjust uh, our resources uh, from one area uh, to, uh, and to diversify our economy essentially, first to new sources of growth and um, into uh, new economic structures uh, 
so that we are able to respond. And just as an example, for example, in Asia, we used to be export-led economies, and now we're far well exports are still, uh, trade is still important. Uh, we are now, our growth is driven by domestic demand. And this is important. Of course, first of all, it was driven by investment demand and there were excessive investments that had its consequences as well. But now our economies are driven by consumption demand. And actually Asia is going to form uh, more than 50% of uh, 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 is being projected uh, going forward into the future, we will represent 50% of um, consumption demand in the global economy, including this includes the, the greater Asia. So uh, having diversified economies put us in a more resilient position. Also, um, investment, adequate investment into infrastructure. This is important and the different kinds of infrastructure uh, that is necessary for the functioning of the economy and for its connectivity, uh, not only within economies, but with the rest of the world. And secondly, which is very re more relevant to central banks is for the financial system to be resilient. And this is what Asia did pay attention to in building our resilience is to have stronger financial institutions, uh, more developed financial markets. And this in particular, we were over-concentrated in, uh, uh, we were uh, bank-centric uh, financial systems, but now 50% um, of the financing is from the capital market, in particular the bond market. And then uh, to have in place the resolution mechanisms, including the, the uh, safety nets, and this is having deposit insurance in place. And what is important, we discovered, especially for capital flows, not only uh, of, of surveillance for uh, on the financial institutions and markets, but on capital flows, so that we're very well aware of the uh, conditions that are prevailing, and we can recognize uh, imminent uh, potentials of instability because the earlier signals uh, is uh, not only in the financial institutions, but in the financial markets. And then subjecting our institutions to stress tests, uh, having a wider set of powers and policy toolkits and including unconventional ones. And then uh, what we have benefited immensely uh, is the regional integration and collaboration and cooperation. This is important in terms of surveillance, in terms of uh, uh, policies, uh, sharing of experience and capacity building and so on. And then another thing that I'm going to mention, which is often been overlooked, is uh, financial inclusion. Uh, raising financial literacy and greater participation. And this becomes important now, particularly because of uh, the COVID and the importance of um, distributing relief and so on. The more people that are involved in uh, uh, the financial system, the easier it is uh, to uh, give out uh, these support and relief. Uh, and it's more accounted for when it occurs within the formal financial system. And this issue uh, that is raised from time to time, uh, I know that we are not elected officials in the uh, um, uh, central bank, but nevertheless, we have to uh, be very aware of uh, the consequence of uh, rising inequalities arising from these kind of uh, um, crises. And then uh, the third thing relates to having strong institutions. And this is very important, both in the public and the private sector, commercial institutions. Uh, in it is the governance, uh, the institutional competence and capability, uh, the level of integrity and corruption, all, all these uh, 
impacts on the resilience of any country. And uh, it allows for efficient use of resources and uh, it allows for uh, better overall economic and financial performance. Now, the, the fourth one uh, relates to um, identifying and dealing with uh, the areas of vulnerabilities. And this uh, is also important. Well before any crisis, you should have addressed your areas of vulnerabilities, your areas of leverage and indebtedness, uh, your deficits that you may have, whether it's balance of payments or, or, or uh, fiscal deficits. And uh, the most impressive one is Indonesia. They resu reduce their deficit to, uh, as a percentage of GDP, something like 1.5%. And of course, when this crisis happened and the demand for fiscal stimulus and support, uh, they uh, inc had the fiscal room uh, to respond. And then uh, dealing with areas of inefficiencies, rising inequalities, and uh, to yield essentially strong initial conditions. So, uh, for example, most of us entered this COVID crisis in Asia from a position of strength uh, in terms of its financial system. And therefore, yes, there are going to be a lot of business closures and uh, um, rising non-performing loans, but because they come from highly capitalized and highly profitable financial institutions, they are, have an ability to absorb this and uh, remain resilient. Uh, and the final one, the fifth one, is having a risk management uh, system in place. And this is uh, very critical knowing what can go wrong. And I've always been told, actually, we had this discussion at the Bank of England, actually, that when you start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, actually, it might be an oncoming train. And uh, this is uh, um, something that uh, we need to ask ourselves, what is the worst thing that can go wrong and so on, so that we minimize and then finally, I should mention uh, that, that uh, which I did mention already, is the collaboration. Uh, when we faced the Asian financial crisis, we managed it on our own. But uh, following that, uh, we worked together in terms of surveillance, sharing of policy options, and having one voice, which is quite powerful in terms of our solidarity in Asia. And recently, two weeks ago, actually, we came together with Asia Pacific to sign a major trade agreement, uh, RESIP, uh, it's called, ASEAN and uh, five other major countries in Asia Pacific. And th this is important. Uh, so that, uh, and just to conclude with uh, the one aspect that we mustn't forget uh, that uh, central banking business is for the long haul and we should have a long term horizon and sustainability is very important. And this aspect is that uh, we need to care about the community and the environment uh, as well, so that the overall resilience uh, is uh, achieved. Thank you, Hans. Thank you very much, Dr. Zetti, for this uh, introduction to laying out the various aspects of resilience and, uh, and institution building. Could I now turn to Sir Paul for his uh, introductory remarks, please? You are muted, please. And first of all, thank you very, very much for inviting me to do this. It's a real, it's a real treat. And it's a treat and a real pleasure and privilege to join Dr. Zetti. This doesn't need to be said, but no one watching should have any doubt that Dr. Zetti is one of the great crisis managers and resilience builders of our generation of, of central bankers and public officials um, more generally. Um, it, it's quite tempting simply to applaud and, and say that I agree with everything um, that Dr. Zetti said, which I think I which I think I do, um, but, but I'll try and say much the same set of things, perhaps in a slightly different way. 
first, and I, Dr. Zetti said this very clearly a number of times, but I want to underline it. We, it, it's absolutely vital not to think of resilience solely in terms of doing things that will reduce the probability of a crisis. Um, so this is the this is almost the original sin of banking supervision in the half century up to 2008. And I, I, I've known many really great bank supervisors from all over the world. And they were, first of all, almost exclusively focused on um, reducing the probability of failure. And yet when challenged in public or asked in public would say they were not trying to reduce the probability of failure to, to zero. And, and resilience um, absolutely includes being able to cope tolerably well for one society and the broader world when that, nasty, that low but nasty probability um, crystallizes. Resilience includes um, being able to cope with a crisis. In fact, I think a, a reasonable definition of a crisis is, is, is something for which one is not remotely prepared, doesn't have the legal powers, and will be enormously socially costly. Right? So a crisis is not just bad things happening. It's not being able to cope de facto or de jure when those bad things um, happen. That's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing is that this discussion is international because the world is an independent place and has been for a long time. Um, Dr. Zetti and I and many other people on this on this video conference and met for the first time in and around Basel. Basel is in some senses the, the creation of, of crisis. Um, Montague Norman and Benjamin Strong, the governors of the, of the Bank of England and the New York Fed um, back in the 20s and 30s. They were, they were slightly crazy people, by the way, each of them. Um, but they were certainly internationalists. And their, their drive to make Basel an important place for central banks to, to kind of meet and exchange ideas and, and where possible cooperate was as much as anything driven by the failure of Credit Anstalt Bank in, in Austria um, that ricocheted and brought down the US financial system. When one looks back now, um, and this is not just true of people in Latin America, say, or um, Asia, people in Europe as well, let's say some Austrian bank. Well, this is one of the great banks of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had been one of the great land empires um, in Europe for around a thousand years. Um, so Credit Anstalt was a very, very important world bank. And when it failed, it brought down the world financial um, system. But I think what we've been seeing over the past um, nearly a year now with the pandemic crisis is that we not only have to think about interdependence, which is a good thing, but avoiding overdependence um, as well. Part of what was seen certainly in, in Europe and the United States um, was lack of resilience in all sorts of forms, not enough intensive care um, units and, and beds in some hospital. Um, depending on um, importing essential medical kit um, from countries that might not necessarily be friendly in a, in a crisis. And I don't think we should dwell too much um, on this, but there are tectonic shifts in the world's geopolitics. They're gonna carry on for 25 to 50 years. Um, and during that period, we somehow need to avoid overdependence, but maintain interdependence so that we don't retreat back to autarky. And that's that's the job of statesmen and women, and it's going to be it's going to be difficult. And actually, I'm saying this partly because I think that there are other parts of our economic life where where ministries have something to learn from the style of cooperation that exists um, among central bankers. Um, which is which is kind of more than a repeat game. It's it's a sense of um, community um, solidarity. But um, 
not always solidarity that can be relied on. Two of the great central bankers I knew well, very close to one of them and knew the other well, were Eddie George and, and Jerry Corrigan. Well, during the failure of the BCCI Bank, Jerry, I was the governor's private secretary at the time, so I was listening on the line. Jerry called Eddie, who was the deputy governor, and said that the Federal Reserve would not cooperate with the Bank of England in the manner in which BCCI was going to be um, closed down. And instead, they, they were going to kind of ring fence, especially the UK assets, out of the US assets. And the point about this story um, is that close relationships, uh, however close they are and however admiring of each other and respectful the protagonists are, they are not a substitute for an ex-ante plan that is credible. Um, the, the signal of the relationship in that, in that um, incident, as it was really for the UK, was that Jerry called Eddie and said they weren't going to cooperate. Whereas in many other cases, the country would just not have cooperated and not made the call. We would have discovered on the wire services um, or something. So that was something, but it, it wasn't good enough. Um, and we can plan for, for better. Those are some preliminary remarks. I want to make, um, say some things about macro policy, national balance sheet policy, and then finance very, very quickly. Um, having a plan um, for supporting the economy through crises includes recognizing that there are circumstances in which the burden of demand stimulus needs to shift from monetary policy to, to fiscal policy. And I, I'm one who, exaggerating somewhat, basically thinks the, the balance of macroeconomic stimulus, at least in the West, has been largely the wrong way around for the past half decade um, or more. And I think although they can't parade this in, in public and it would be a tactical mistake to do so and probably in deeper respects as well, I think the central bank should be spending private time thinking about what a decent fiscal framework looks like quietly helping their ministries of finance develop um, fiscal frameworks. And a good fiscal framework will, will cater for very bad states of the world. Whereas in fact, what we've seen is fiscal frameworks, um, certainly in Europe, certainly in my own country, to the extent that the US has a fiscal framework at all, then in the United States as well, where actually the kind of circumstances um, that we have been in over the past 12 months, and in fact, over the past five years um, of sclerotic productivity growth, very weak underlying growth, um, and very low long-term interest rates were not anticipated um, at all. And my response to that is, well, then the fiscal framework wasn't very good because it didn't actually think about, didn't cater for what could um, happen. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, which I started to think about in the late 1990s when serving on a committee chaired by Mario Draghi, Mario Draghi in his Italian um, treasury um, um, period about national balance sheets and vulnerabilities in the, um, in the aftermath of the Asian uh, um, crisis. And although I think that um, Many individual countries, particularly actually in Asia, unsurprisingly, because East Asian, Southeast Asia, and Northeast Asian economies faced problems with their national um, balance sheet. Actually, for the world as a whole, very little has been has been done to identify um, vulnerabilities in national balance sheets and how they can be um, contained. And there's an unresolved debate, I'm going to personalize it, not, not that I, it doesn't kind of feature in this way in debate, it's just how I think about it, because of a debate at a particular conference. You have people like Olivia Blanchard, who want to tax short-term capital flows, um, which I don't, because I think it would be evaded too easily. And people like me who want to um, focus on the stocks, um, 
and have some benchmark heuristic um, for to identify uh, abject vulnerabilities in a in a nation's external balance sheet and what should be what should be done about it. And um, I, I think that because it doesn't lend itself very clearly to rules that they can cascade down to the area departments. The IMF, I think, has done much less on this than it could have done, um, and actually sticks to focusing on the things that it it goes around the world prescribing, even when they're not even when they're not needed. Um, the, the third thing is the financial system it, itself. Um, some good did come out of the two thousand and eight crisis. I think the the one of the most significant was widespread recognition that the US system of deposit insurance um, works incredibly efficiently and credibly for small and medium sized deposit takers. And certainly in Europe, in none of the European states that I know of, had there been sufficient investment to make deposit insurance credible. And actually big picture, I think that is still um, the case. Um, and, I, and I say that having sent Bank of England people to join the FDIC, resolving small banks in, I think, actually in Alabama, which was I mean, one of the terrific experience um, for them. But it was also recognized that the standard um, deposit insurance toolkit doesn't help you um, resolve the largest banks um, and dealers in, in, in the world. And I think um, I, I think that top supervisors and indeed top central bankers are far less focused on on resolution than they than they ought to be. They have they have somehow acquiesced in this um, becoming something for the technicians in one of their departments rather than something that they think about at least most weeks, if not every day. And I think I, I, that's that's really interesting actually because. Central bankers are economists who understand about incentives. For most central banks, the failure of their largest um, banks or dealers will be the single most awful thing that happens to them in their professional career. Um, and and I don't I don't I don't see recognition um, of that around the world, which I find quite surprising actually, given that we're only um, just over 10 years away from the implosion um, of the world financial um, system. The second thing is, is, is lender of last resort um, policies. I think it's, it's I think a good, uh, a good rule of thumb um, is if, if ex post you're going to end up doing it, then ex ante plan for it. Um, and I think that entails all sorts of things where in relation to shadow banking, it becomes necessary either to make it absolutely clear um, and 100% credible that you will not lend to non-bank banks or alternatively to recognize that you will and somehow bring them into the regulatory net and, and plan. Um, for it. The, the final things I want to say is, um, perhaps this is the most important thing in, in some respects, which is that the policy community, it seems to me, it is most active and innovative after something has gone horribly wrong. And that may, of course, that doesn't sound very surprising to the people watching. I think the surprising thing, um, less so about finance ministries led by elected officials, more so about central banks led and staffed by unelected officials, is the relative passivity in response to near misses. And of course, near misses that don't blow up um, the country or the, or the world economy or the regional economy aren't politically salient to the same degree. But as professionals, one should recognize that they were near misses. And there was 
There was one, well, actually more than one in late 2002. Fortunately, not in my country, but I think in the United States and in, in continental Europe. Um, and right now there was one in March um, where I think it is almost impossible to explain the weight of, of, of bond purchases in, in March and April, unless one thinks that, um, I think it is a plausible um, hypothesis that they must have been extremely worried about the failure of some probably shadow banking type institutions. And I say that because there's not much point in stimulating aggregate demand when aggregate supply is closing down. And you certainly don't need to um, purchase that um, quantity of assets in order to maintain liquidity in the bond markets, as Mario Draghi demonstrated rather brilliantly in 2012. And so I think we have had a very powerful signal in the spring of this year that the resilience of the international financial system is weak in certain respects, not just inadequate, but weak in certain respects. And I think it's tremendously important um, that something is done about that. And, I, and my hope as the years pass is that um, central bankers in Asia and Latin America and Africa will begin to put more pressure um, on central bankers from the supposed rich West um, to fix the continuing weaknesses um, in their financial system because at least for the next quarter of a century, the world is largely going to depend um, on that financial system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for, for your remarks. Uh, very rich. And uh, echoing to a large extent what Dr. Seti said. There are some questions in the, in the chat box or in the Q&A box, uh, which I will get to um, in, in due course. Uh, let me try to ask one question which combines um, some that have been shown there. And that is that the world economy, uh, as, as suggested by the IMF and various other institutions, uh, is uh, facing a situation where uh, there would be long-term scars from the, the current downturn. And uh, combining that with very, very low interest rates in some countries, people talk about uh, liquidity traps, very high levels of debt, so uh, fiscal space might be reduced. What is it that uh, are, uh, is the world economy resilient? I, uh, I'm, of course, uh, exaggerating a bit, uh, suggesting that uh, these sorts of situations are uh, present in all, in all parts of the world. Asia, in particular, doesn't have some of the problems of very, very low interest rates and very high debt but many other parts are. Is there something, uh, are we prepared for the next crisis? Any, uh, any reaction to that, Dr. Zetti or Paul? <laughs> I think Paul is going to say something. Okay, okay. Um... I think this um, metaphor of scarring is helpful and unhelpful. Um, first of all, it's plainly going to take some while, at least in the West, for economies to return to um, the path that they were on um, before. But that path wasn't very good. Um, underlying growth was very weak in the West. And it, people are inclined, commentators certainly in the West are inclined to say that COVID is a crisis, which of course um, it is. But I think another, um, almost a crisis, is the weakness of underlying growth. And I, and I say that for kind of social reasons and political reasons, partly. If you imagine a world, let's say a world, um, one close economy, with zero productivity growth. This is a zero sum game um, um, in terms of resources. I can only be better off if you're all worse off. 
the people on this call can only be better off if everybody else is worse off. These are, these are conditions. A world of very low growth is a world in which mercantilism becomes um, an attractive, um, albeit fairly stupid, um, trade policy. It, I don't find it at all surprising that Britain's move to kind of unilateral free trade in, in the 19th century, which I think was, was a brave thing to do, but it was taken against a background of extraordinary growth in, in Britain and a change of political economy and ideas that that, that brought. So I think that um, and within a society, um, as, as, as Western societies address problems of um, inequality, that, of course, is harder if, if growth were to be zero, because it means taking resources away um, from people rather than um, redistributing the, the benefits of growth in a slightly different um, way. So I think the, scar the scarring um, so-called matters, if it makes that even worse, and it kind of might over the short run, the, the, the more optimistic story about which no one can have any confidence whatsoever is that maybe the dislocation that we have had over the last year will be a trigger for, for spurring um, extraordinary technological innovations that we've seen over the past quarter of a century into what economists call technical progress. And mostly technical progress is about improved efficiency in, in, in production, design, and, and, and systems. And one wonders whether the experience of COVID, including having conferences like this by Zoom and not getting on airplanes, et cetera, will, um, will provide a spur to technical um, progress. I think, and one final sentence. I, I think this question about fiscal space, um, I'm not someone that believes fiscal space is infinite. That would be truly crazy. But I, I, I think we are at risk, again, in the West, which I know more about, that, that people will um, proclaim that there is not fiscal space um, when in fact there is, given how low long-term real interest rates are. And I think this is a potential disaster for central banks because to the extent that fiscal actors don't act, um, and of course they're not obliged to act, so everybody looks to the central bank to essentially reinvent themselves um, as, a, as a credit organization, steering the allocation of credit to sectors or regions that they think will um, um, could benefit the economy as a whole, as well as trying to alleviate hardship. I doubt whether that answers the question, um, Hans, but, but those were my, my thoughts. Thank you. Dr. Zetti. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I will add a little bit more. I also agree with most of what Paul has said. And the one, of course, in Asia, uh, we have do have some policy space left uh, in terms of interest rate policy and fiscal space as well. But uh, and our underlying growth uh, was uh, not, it was slower than previously, but it wasn't weak in that sense. So there's a potential for Asia to rise up uh, and contribute towards global growth. Uh, but the one way in which uh, I believe is uh, productivity is the one that can be raised immensely. Most of us are starting from very low levels of productivity. So there's tremendous potential uh, to uh, contribute to overall econ economic performance growth and strengthening um, Productivity, and I agree with Paul. It's not a zero-sum game, uh, and um, the parts of the developed world should realize that uh, that uh, uh, it isn't, uh, and therefore we should work together in terms of our areas of comparative advantage uh, to contribute to the overall uh, global economy, and then um, definitely uh, spurring. Uh, te technological uh, progress and uh, 
greater efficiency it is all part of it too. And we believe that we can achieve more with less. Uh, and this is one of the ways uh, to take it forward in these uh, challenging times. Thank you. Um, I believe there was a hand raised by uh, Jacob Frankel, former head oh. of research at the IMF and uh, former professor of mine at the University of Chicago. Jacob, <laughs> would you like to uh, uh, give us yes. your thoughts? Well, I'll be very uh, quick because I want to leave room for others. But this was a very inspiring presentation. And thank you so much for putting it uh, together. I want to do a few reflections on the remarks, on the opening remarks of uh, Governor Zetti. I think that the issue of uh, building resilience in advance is indeed a very central and important uh, issue. The question is, in a, how do we do that? And in addition to the arguments that you have made, uh, properly so, I would add uh, at least one which has to do with increasing awareness in the population and in the political setting on what we are doing. What I'm having in mind is awareness means analytical awareness and historical awareness. For example, you brought an example how the Asian financial crisis has increased the resilience of, uh, of uh, Malaysia for the next round, where that uh, subsequent crisis helped less because of the increased awareness, building up the system. And I think that the history and the analytical one is important. Second, we were talking about the toolkit. Many people ask about the toolkit. Do we have enough toolkits? And frankly, I think that uh, uh, some of the policymakers are trying to leave the impression in order to enhance confidence that our toolkit is appropriate. And if now we have guidance and we have uh, other quote instruments, in my judgment, interest rates is still the most important tool in the toolkits. And we need therefore to classify some of the instruments in the toolkits according to their potency. And therefore it's not good enough to say we have additional tool to replace the interest rate, which is now paralyzed because, because of the lower bound and all the rest. I think we need to be aware of it. And finally, the issue of debt. Uh, it is now becoming fashionable that uh, debt is less of a constraint on public finance because the cost of borrowing is so low and therefore one can really uh, in increase a uh, bring to recovery through increasing debt. I just want to alert all of us that the configuration of low interest rates is not permanent forever. And therefore, if we build our assets and liabilities under the assumption that interest rates will remain low forever, we increase our vulnerability rather than increase our resilience. And finally, really, you spoke about lengthening the horizon, which is so important for central banks. I think that part of the instruments to lengthen the horizon is an institutional one, including the length of term of governors, including the rotation rules on board members and the things that have to maintain the historical memory of institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Any reaction to that? Uh by the panelists. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you another question, which has come up in the in the chat. Okay, let me let me ask um, a question about lender last resort. You brought it up, Paul. Um, and the question is, um, how do we 
uh, how do we, should we think about the regulatory perimeter in the context of lending, lender of last resort, and with special reference to the big tech companies that are becoming incre increasingly uh, like um, financial intermediary, traditional financial intermediaries? Dr. Zetti, would you like to go first? Well, the, the lender of the last resort is the sole uh, uh, right uh, or the sole uh, uh, function of uh, the central bank. Uh, there's no other uh, lender of the last resort within the country. And um, the, the regulatory parameters around this are, are very vital and they should be in place well before the crisis has happened. How do you decide whether it's a liquidity or a solvency issue. And are you pouring good money into uh, a bad uh, situation? So this is a challenge. And that is why I've always felt uh, that uh, the regulate the supervisory oversight uh, has to be within the central bank so that the assessment can be made uh, at very short notice uh, who has uh, the expertise on the assessments. And then now, of course, we have all the stress tests, the very sophisticated stress tests uh, to make uh, these kind of assessments. And we have uh, the regulatory parameters. But I know uh, certain countries in uh, central banks in uh, the um, Asian uh, region, there were questions uh, on and uh, some translated into legal, uh, where uh, actually some senior officials were uh, um, uh, held accountable uh, for, for, for this. So uh, it is, uh, I agree fully that uh, uh, you need the regulatory parameters, you need the institutional capability and competence to make the assessment and you are, are held accountable uh, for it. Um, so uh, this is where we are. And uh, the central bank should be the one calling the shots. In other words, we're not going to, uh, shouldn't be getting, and central bank independence uh, has to be here getting calls on who gets the credit line and who doesn't. Uh, it is based on the expertise that resides in the bank and the assessments uh, the, of the supervisory and uh, regulatory authority that resides with the central bank. Thank you. Paul? I, I very much agree with that. The, the first thing I would say is that um, I think there should be a presumption that supervision is in the central, in the central bank for precisely the reason that Dr. Zetti gives, which is the lender of last resort function. When, when all of this was changing around 25 years ago, there was a paper, I'm not going to name the authors, but they're a good friend of everybody, uh, that was incredibly influential, saying, actually, you know, you could do it either way, really, but um, because you could have smooth information flows between uh, an outside um, um, supervisor and the central bank. And actually, it's, I, I think that's possible in some cultures, but, but, but um, I don't mean civilizational cultures. I mean that an accident of the history of a particular country is such that there will be active um, cooperation. I think Australia probably um, fits that, um, that description. Um, in the UK, it was utterly naive. There was almost no information flows whatsoever and disaster, an unnecessary disaster um, ensued. So my, 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 I think the default assumption is that super supervision should be in the central bank, unless in the particular circumstances of a country, one is really confident that there will be proper um, cooperation. And one needs to think about this like a political scientist, not like a macroeconomist. Um, on the, the question about shadow banking in particular, tech, I mean, um, 
my views on this haven't changed in gracious 30 odd years. If it looks like a bank, then treat it as a bank. And I think banking laws around the world are, are pretty weak in this respect. Um, by, by look like a bank, I mean that there is some combination of liquidity transformation leverage with an asset portfolio that is either opaque and, or a liquid or, or both. And on this test, of course, Morgan Stanley and, and Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers and um, whatever the other one was called, Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, were banks um, in the economic sense before the crisis because they were providing liquidity services via their prime brokerage um, activity. And for the tech businesses starting now, it's whether or not they're a bank doesn't depend on the technology. It depends on the structure of their their balance sheet. I mean, the Francis Baring wrote the first paper, I think, about, so certainly was the first to use the expression lender of last resort. He wrote that paper with a quill pen. Mm -hmm. And that, that the, the basic architecture of, of banking and the basic fragility of banking hasn't changed from the quill pen to where we are today. Uh, I, I was in a, a seminar conference in Berlin two or three or four years ago where somebody, a kind of inspiring tech person, gave a speech about how they're developing a kind of tech bank. And he proclaimed during it um, that balance sheets were irrelevant going forward, that it was all to do with, uh, with the pipes, which he said far more eloquently than I just have. And I sidled up to somebody at the end and said, if this person has actually got a, a balance sheet, then you should not be licensing um, them. Because they, because they did not understand the nature of the business um, that they were in. And I don't think it's at all surprising that in the States, when we've seen kind of, I'm not going to name any of the businesses, oh, we'll connect the public directly with um, lenders. And lo and behold, the public didn't want to place their money with these things because they want deposit insured money. But then the banks and the investment institutions lend, but short term and runnable. If it's runnable, um, there should be a presumption. Um, well, let me put it another way. I think the question that the top central bankers should ask themselves is, is this going to land on my desk saying you need to lend it money now or there's going to be an absolute calamity? And if the answer to that question is, well, actually, yes, quite likely we would have to lend to it in those circumstances, um, and it is at the moment unregulated, then your regulatory system is inadequate. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, we are, we are approaching uh, the one hour limit. Last, uh, uh, last week, couple, two weeks ago, when we had a seminar like this, we went over by 15 minutes, and I was wondering if the panelists are okay. There are a number of questions still outstanding. So if you agree uh, with that, I will, I will ask one question that came from uh, former Governor Glenn Stevens from the RBI. RBA and uh, also uh, linked to that is a question by Senior Deputy Governor of, of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Vera Singe. It's about fiscal policy. And uh, Glenn asks uh, Paul specifically whether, uh, since he spoke about a um, good fiscal framework and uh, how to engage with fiscal authorities about this, if you could elaborate a bit more. And I think that's probably also, certainly also relevant for Malaysia or Asia in general, the, the coordination between fiscal and monetary policy. The, the Deputy Governor, Governor for Sri Lanka asked about the a question related to the mon, so-called mon, modern monetary theory about central banks uh, financing government spending uh, more or less indefinitely. And whether that sort of idea could uh, derail any th talk about and coordination with fiscal policy. These are uh, wide-ranging questions, but uh, Paul, maybe you can go ahead. I, I think these are these are thank you, Hans, and thank you, Glenn. Um, actually, I'd like to hear Glenn's answer. Um, the I, th I think these are amongst the most important um, um, questions. If, if you let me start off with a kind of rather with a rather um, 
And it's not an abstract point, but I think it's quite a high level point and a very important one. If you think about kind of what motivates um, central bank independence, when you kind of cut through to it, 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 it's partly because we want an institutional framework that will avoid um, the social costs of elected politicians doing things. We want, we want, we want to wait, take away some doing from the, um, the elected politicians and give it to some um, technocrats insulated from day-to-day -day, um, politics. And the reason we want to do that is that we think that the unelected people will stick to the objective, whereas the elected people will prioritize being re-elected and, and so on. And all of that's very familiar. Um, but it, I think it's quite helpful to think of it in terms of, of, of a check on the on elected politicians doing things. The problem that we have had over the five past five years or more is the opposite, which is how do we get politicians to do things which are best done by them? Which is one way of thinking about this is something really bad happens. And there's a meeting between the central bank governor and the, and the finance minister, and, and they agree that they should both do something. It should be a mixed monetary fiscal. Uh, response. And um, the central banker leaves the room. And the minister then discusses with um, her or his staff kind of the political costs of doing so. They're going to have to um, carry their, their prime minister, their cabinet, maybe a coalition in parliament, a party's base, um, in a US type system, all sorts of veto um, players. And this is, you know, the, the political transaction costs are incredibly high. Um, and this is going to involve some pain for the finance minister. And the finance minister says to um, her staff, what, what will happen um, if I don't do anything? And the staff say, oh, well, then the central banker will do more. And the finance minister says, well, let's um, go along with that for the time being. And I want to connect um, Glenn's question to what Jacob was saying. And I'm going to make a slight straw man of Jacob. Jacob kind of was, was arguing on the one hand that central bank tools are more or less exhausted, but on the other hand, um, we, we should be very careful about um, using fiscal policy, or at least debt finance fiscal policy. And I think it's a, a fact that with long interest rates much lower than they were, much, much lower, the constraints on the public finances are smaller. So they still exist, of course, there is still a limit. And the problem with modern monetary theory, um, which in a sense isn't, in, uh, it isn't a theory in a, in a deeper sense, but the, the problem with it rhetorically is implying that there is no limit to the amount of debt that you can have because the central bank can always print the money. But of course, ultimately, that is merely a different way of defaulting. You can default by not sending the payments, or you can default by making the payments and the, prin the principal and interest payments worthless in terms of what they can kind of purchase. Um, and so I, th I think the reason I go through that is that I think we need a, a fiscal framework, possibly through um, turbocharged, if you like, nonlinear automatic stabilizers. Um, where it's clearer where fiscal policy will need to, to, to kick in during a kind of prolonged slump where the, the central bank's policy rate is stuck at the zero lower bound. And one of the reasons I find this attractive is that one of the, and, and it underlines in these circumstances, the importance of the central, of an independent central bank, because then rather than the central bank being the actor with a pushing against the string, um, instead, the central, the independent central bank becomes a check on fiscal excess because they can tighten policy if fiscal policy goes, um, goes too far. Um, so actually, uh, you know, this is an exaggeration, but in some respects, I think that um, the whole way of thinking about policy and the way that that policy is, is inscribed, the current policy mix is inscribed into the structure of the fiscal monetary game, which is Stackelberg essentially, um, 
is, I think, um, the wrong way around. I think the, the effect is the wrong way around of where we should be now. I think we should have much more fiscal stimulus, much less reliance on the central bank. But with the central, the independent central bank acting, think of Paul Volcker as a as a break on on fiscal excess, because in the limit, of course, or before the limit, um, Jacob is is right. And who's going to police that? And it actually should be policed by the central bank. But we shouldn't expect the central bank to repeat myself to be able to stimulate um, an economy when. Um, its instruments are almost used up. And I agree with what I think Jacob said, that it's, although it's short term, it's tempting in the short term, uh, I think it is a mistake for central bankers to proclaim that they have a greater capacity to, to restore the economy to a nice growth path than actually they have. I think this is more of a Western problem and more of a, a highly advanced economy problem than it is among the emerging markets, but it's it's a pretty big problem, I think, in the in the Northern Hemisphere. Adrizetti? Yes, uh, just a, a few words to add. Uh, first of all, it's not only uh, the instruments are used up, uh, in terms of uh, interest rates reaching their lower bound, but the, the capacity to restore the economy, the, the outcome since the uh, previous crisis has shown that even near zero interest rates and the massive quantitative easing didn't restore economies to become uh, vibrant. Uh, we had weak growth. Uh, following uh, the 08, 09 crisis. And therefore, uh, it's just what Paul has said, it's not only used up, uh, but uh, not delivering, not being able to deliver the outcomes. And any policy objective must, uh, any policy must know the outcome and the objective of the policy. And it's clearly that fiscal is the one uh, that uh, will be able to deliver uh, growth, but it needs to be implemented effectively in the highest impact areas uh, in addition to providing the relief. And therefore, uh, the central bank, as Paul has said, represents uh, the check. And what will happen, aside from central banks, in some cases where they acquire the uh, bonds, raised to uh, finance the uh, funding of uh, the fiscal stimulus, but it just means that it's going to extend over uh, generations, that this, this debt burden is going to extend over generations. And that is why we have to look at other structural changes uh, that will look at other potential areas that will lift the economy uh, back. Uh, and one of the areas that uh, was focused on where the commercial sector can have a role is uh, guarantee, credit guarantee schemes have been very highly effective uh, used in uh, many parts of Asia. So that there's financing uh, to um, stimulate growth. And also the investment has to be not just uh, on the immediate term, but on infrastructure that will build the potential for the economy to also uh, grow, in addition to what we discussed earlier about productivity and efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I uh, am quite aware that we are we are over going, over reaching our time here, but I, I do want to ask perhaps a, a last question coming from an educational institution where, where I am right now. And about uh, this is about capacity building and central bank sort of resilience and agility of, of the staff to think uh, about uh, you know, 
the, the future possible crises, the future reactions of that crisis, are central banks or are academic institutions training uh, their students well enough so that when they come, are employed by the central bank, they have this, uh, first of all, uh, was mentioned the historical perspective. Uh, and secondly, the analytical sort of breadth of, of thought to deal with possible uh, changes in, in uh, the economy beyond what they learned in, in, in their graduate school and so on. Is there a case for uh, thinking about capacity building in central banks that uh, will help build resilience within the institution? Any thoughts on? Uh, well, of course, uh, the the uh, the exposure that uh, central bankers have to all these issues and to recognize uh, how they have been addressed and what kind of results uh, they they produce. All this uh, is very valuable for any central banker, and uh, most certainly. Uh, I had the very good fortune of uh, engaging with uh, all the central banks actually from around the world and learning from them on different aspects of uh, central banking. And this is what the education system ha has to do, uh, not only uh, for the historical part of the uh, institutional memory, what Jacob uh, referred to, but also uh, for, for the future, because our environment is going to be so different. Uh, you have to uh, reinvent yourselves all, all the time. Previously, for example, uh, you uh, needed, uh, didn't need um, to be uh, able to communicate uh, to the various stakeholders, whereas now it's very critical. If you don't, uh, the issue will snowball and uh, will, with adverse consequences on the central bank. So the central bank has to be very effective in all its communication and uh, also building its relationship and relationship with all the stakeholders, including uh, the, the, the uh, political uh, uh, relationship while not allowing it to compromise the central bank independence. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I agree with, with all of that. So let me focus on something else. Perhaps it's worth saying that before I was a policymaker for around a dozen years, I was a staffer for just over 20 um, years. And I want to make two points about the inside of a central bank and how one should develop people. Um, central banks, and certainly central banks involved in both financial stability and monetary policy. But even those that just do monetary policy because of their markets and then of large resort involvement will have different kinds of specialism um, inside. And it's really important that these are not cultural silos. And in particular, there isn't a kind of pecking order of superiority that either the, um, the economics PhDs are a higher life form than the supervisors or markets people or, or that the markets people are a higher life form than the than the um, economists. And um, I, I, I've, I've seen various, I think I've seen, I think I saw three um, kind of hierarchies of esteem, depending on who was the dominant figures towards the top of the bank. And I, I thought they were all kind of pretty bad thing, really. And I think the only way through that is, is to have a kind of mix of, of high esteem for being a star um, an economic research and analysis or a star in the market stuff or a star in the credential stuff and other things as well that I'm not mentioning, but also have other people. And this, of course, includes Dr. Betty and, and I, so I would say this, um, who, do a, who, do, who move around the institution. And while I also think it's important that they don't become the ultimate high life form, um, in, in central banks. They're actually tremendously important people because they're the people that can show that it's, it's possible to be a supervisor and be a monetary um, policy um, person. And they provide, if nothing else, it shouldn't just be the stars that do this, 
um, they kind of provide um, translation services. I mean, I've talked about this a lot over the years. Julian Tett talked about it in her, um, in her book on, on silos. I think, uh, I think avoiding um, a central bank becoming a series of silos, or worse than that, rival um, silos is tremendously important. Because then when something that happens that really requires um, the machine to get together in a joined up way, and crises, one way, in, in the central banking world, one thing that crises, one thing that crises do is that they erode the barriers between different disciplines. Suddenly, um, looking outside the central bank, um, debt management becomes important for how the central bank thinks. Supervision does, and, and um, all sorts of other things. And so one can't somehow inculcating a culture that other disciplines, the discipline that one hasn't chosen for oneself, is truly worthy of respect. Um, and that one isn't part of a higher form of life or a lower form of professional um, life is, I think, tremendously um, important. And I, I think some of the top central banks in the world, um, you know, major, maybe actually the major central bank in the world, does not store well on, um, on that. So I, this isn't some kind of imaginary thing that I think is only part of the history of the Bank of England. I, I'm not going to do it, but I could, you know, I think I could identify it in some of the most important central bank institutions um, in the world. And I think it's tremendously important for the staff just for them to kind of have a sense that what they're doing and not earning lots of money doing something pointless somewhere else, um, but that what they're doing is, is a really tremendously important um, thing to do and a very, very good way of living a life. Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to take that uh, opportunity to make a little bit of an advertisement for what we are doing at the Asia School of Business on, on central banking. One, of course, one uh, initiative is, are these uh, webinars and conversations of central banking, where we try to bring in uh, people like, uh, like yourselves and others uh, to talk about various aspects of central banking. The other is, of course, our uh, program, uh, our Masters of Central Banking program, which is intended really to for, for staff to uh, get out of their silos to learn about the entire uh, work of a central bank. Uh, but um, uh, let me not uh, dwell on that, uh, but I do want to say uh, that uh, next week, uh, the 16th of December, at 8 p.m. KL time, we have another uh, session of this um, uh, conversation with approaches to financial crisis, uh, which I suspect will be some of a continuation of the discussion we have had today to uh, some expect, uh, aspects and former governor of the Central Bank of Iceland and Patrick Honohan, former governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. And uh, my colleague Ellie Remolona will be the moderator. And with that, uh, let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Zetti and Sir Paul for a really a very enriching discussion. And uh, also I want to thank the audience for uh, having stayed with us and uh, asked questions throughout the session. And I'm sorry if I couldn't get to all the questions that were, were posted, but we will get to them at another time. Again, uh, Dr. Zetti, Sir Paul, thank you very, very much for your uh, pres presence this, this afternoon. Thank you.